USC and UCLA bringing remarkable histories of athletic success with them. A mind-boggling 274 combined team national championships. They're about 10 miles apart in LA. They both play at legendary venues. Just a grand slam from the Big Ten's point of view in terms of fit and history. The move enlarges the Big Ten to 16 schools. will match the SEC as the two largest in the Power Five when that league adds Texas and Oklahoma. It's the first time the Big Ten has ever made a move to a non-contiguous state. Remember, Penn State joined in the early 90s, Nebraska, Rutgers, and Maryland in the 2010s, and then this latest addition, which will take effect in time for the 2024 fall sports season. Let's go to today's big interview. It is Ohio State Athletic Director Gene Smith, kind enough to take some time out to join us. Gene, great to see you. Uh, you have already spoken publicly about this edition, but for those who may not have seen that interview with the media from uh, the end of last week, give us a sense of why you think this edition made so much sense, or these editions, I should say, made so much sense for the Big Ten. Well, thank you, Dave. Appreciate uh, being on and appreciate all the work you do. And, you know, it's just uh, two great institutions, uh, academically sound institutions, uh, A. You universities that bring so much uh, to our culture. We have similar cultures and commitment to student athlete welfare and commitment to diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion in their sports programs and just great, rich tradition and history. And, and of course, uh, they bring the LA market, uh, a place where uh, the Big Ten institutions have a large footprint of alums. And so we are really excited about uh, the opportunities as we move forward. As are we. It is a really exciting time, I think, <laughs> for everyone associated with the Big Ten. It really is amazing. Why does this make sense from Ohio State's point of view? Well, you know, they are really, really um, always been impressed uh, with the competitive excellence that UCLA and USC has always uh, strove for. And that's why they have so much tradition and history in their athletic programs. And it's something for us at Ohio State uh, that's so important to what we do. And so it, it just matches uh, what we're all about. Besides of matching all the other schools in the Big Ten, it, it matches us as well. So we're also excited about that. At what point did you kind of become aware this was a possibility? Well, I'm fortunate. I, I serve as chair of the Big Ten Television Committee. So uh, I always kind of knew uh, that we could potentially expand. Didn't know who, uh, Kevin. Uh, did a masterful job with this. He really did. Uh, kept it under wraps, uh, working with uh, our television partner, Fox, and ultimately got to these two schools. And uh, I really became aware uh, last uh, third, no, last Wednesday, uh, we had a call uh, talking about strategy and then ultimately Thursday when our presidents voted. So uh, I, I definitively became aware last week. You have mentioned TV a couple of times here, Gene. To what degree is television driving expansion decisions in this day and age? You know, David always have. You know, I served on the Big 8 committee uh, years ago when the Big 8 went to the Big 12. And uh, th that was television dri driven. Uh, there's people want to dance around it, but th that is reality. Uh, so uh, when Nebraska was brought in, when Maryland was brought in, when Rutgers was brought in, all the expansion you've seen across the country, Texas, Oklahoma going to the SEC, uh, there's no question that you, you're you looking at a number of other uh, strategic principles, but uh, television is a, a major part of it. And so uh, we're, we're excited about being in the L.A. market and, and what the L.A. market brings uh, for all of our schools and our television partners. Do you believe expansion's over from the Big Ten's point of view? Yeah, who knows? I, I wish I had a crystal ball, Dave, with <laughs> all the different issues we're dealing with today. Uh, it's impossible to speculate on on anyone, any league, or any institution, and uh, it's just hard to say. Well, what do you think are the biggest issues you have to consider with potential expansion candidates? So, in other words, if you think more broadly about, well, what could the Big Ten do next? What are the factors that you would weigh in in terms of making a decision as to whether or not an institution or institutions are good fits? Yeah, and I, and I guess that's it, fit. I mean, bottom line is we, we have a, some strategic principles that we are lying on, and academics is one of them, student-athlete welfare, 
um, logistics to some degree. Um, and, and when you look at uh, competitive success, we want to make sure we judge that the right way. So there's a number of different factors, but you know, what the, scheduling is critical. And so now as we move to get ready for 24, we'll begin that process of looking at scheduling. And so the same thing will occur if we, we consider other schools moving forward. What do you think is the right scheduling model for a 16-team league? You know, I'm very open. I really want to uh, listen to my colleagues and, you know, discuss our, our format that has worked exceptionally well for us over the years. We have to remember uh, that what we put in place, uh, whatever year that was, uh, it's, it's worked well for us. I think it's 2012. It's worked extremely well. So we need to make sure we don't uh, damage what we put in place. And so I'm looking forward to listening to my colleagues, whether we stay at nine conference games or 10 or uh, kill divisions or whatever. We just have to do uh, what's best for the entire league. I do want to ask you about your alma mater of Notre Dame. Uh, you certainly know about their devotion to football independence, and I think everyone in college sports respects that. Uh, as you think about the Irish, what do you think are the factors they need to consider as they decide on the next move for them? Because it, it does feel like they hold a lot of cards right now. But well, they've always been in this position, and uh, I was fortunate to have the opportunity to get my degree from there and compete there, and I love my alma mater, except when they're playing us. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I really love them. I, I, my, I've been so blessed to have gotten the education I got. But the, you know, they have to really look at uh, the, the tra tradition and history that they've been able to develop as an independent, and that's important to Notre Dame, and I understand that. Uh, but today's world, they might need to consider what's best for their student athletes. Uh, I've always felt that they should be in a conference as we've moved into this new world order uh, because it provides their football team, for example, an opportunity to chase a conference championship as opposed to just the national championship. Uh, for them, I don't think it's going to be wholly about money. I think the, the, they have to uh, look at their independence value and their relationship with their television partner. But I think that today's age, our student athletes need that opportunity to trade, chase more than the national championship. That's the benefit we've had thus far in the Big Ten. You can chase a division championship, chase a conference championship, and then ultimately the national championship. I'm fascinated to see what they do, and I think all of yeah. college sports is. You mentioned student athlete welfare, Gene, and I think this is a really interesting part of this because you do have Olympic sports. Now, and you have expanded the, the conference footprint dramatically. It certainly is a huge change for USC and UCLA in terms of the distances they mm -hmm. have to travel. Is it possible, like, could you see a scenario where maybe you divide the conference in half for Olympic sports in order to cut down on some of the travel? Um, are, are you concerned? Like, are you comfortable with the notion of Olympic sports athletes literally flying across the country for a regular season game? Kind of where are you in, in that world? Yeah, it's, uh, we've been doing that, frankly. In fact, our, our men's volleyball program uh, coming up in January, I believe, hosts UCLA and, and uh, USC. Um, many of our schools have been competing against uh, the Pac-12 for a number of years in different sports. Uh, now the frequency obviously goes up, so we have to be really smart. That's the thing that gives us uh, the opportunity with this timing of not having to make it effective until 24 is now we can take all of uh, 23 uh, with our coaches input with our student athletes input uh, to try and come up with a model where we minimize the impact on our student athletes travel. Uh, I do believe uh, there's different formats different ways to look at it. Uh, so we uh, I'm really curious on it. Uh, listening to my colleagues. So the one thing that I've always shared is that we always have to bring all the intellectual property together and that's our our faculty reps, our, our senior women administrators, our student athletes and coaches and ADs, and, and we'll come up with a good plan. It's just a matter of, of, of taking the time to do it the right way. Gene, where do you think all this is going, kind of college sports yeah. writ large? Are, are we headed towards two super conferences? What, what's your sense of, of what this is going to look like five or ten years down the line? Yeah, Dave, that's a really good question, and I, I ponder that off and on. I, uh, I'm really not sure. You know, I, I do believe we, we need to think about uh, governance of, of all of sports and, and certainly football and 
uh, think about how that should be, whether it's in the NCAA or whether it's in a CFP or some other model. We just have to figure that out because um, governance is critical. Uh, we have some issues in that space. Uh, but uh, then, then how do we continue uh, to provide the, the right benefits to our student athletes, um, be it access to more NIL opportunities and how that's structured or, or some other form uh, of benefits as we move forward. There's just so many different issues. And so I don't know what it's going to look like five years from now. And uh, hopefully uh, we keep the main thing, the main thing. This is truly a quality educational experience that sometimes we forget about. All the lessons learned through sport competition and, and, and participation are significant, significant. Many athletes become leaders in our complex society. We cannot forget that that is the core thing we do. Uh, so I, I hope that we never lose that. Uh, and that's for every sport, uh, be it swimming or volleyball or football. Uh, those student athletes learn invaluable lessons. It's the last incubator in higher education where you can create that experience. And so hopefully we never lose that. Well said, and obviously you are a living example of that as we talked about a, a former student athlete yourself. I wanna leave you with this. You, you talk about NIL and you have been very involved in that. You co-chaired the working group that kind of tried to determine where NIL was headed. Uh, I, I know we're still trying to figure that out, but yeah, we are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how comfortable are you with kind of where we are right now with NIL? Because until all of this happened, that's what we were talking about this summer was NIL and to a lesser extent, kind of a, how it, it interacts with the transfer portal. How comfortable are you with where we are with NIL right now? You know, it's, NIL is largely working exceptionally well, particularly uh, in our Olympic sports where student athletes are on a portion of a scholarship and typically leave with debt. Now they're able to mitigate that. Uh, however, we have some problems. We, we have to figure out a way to deal with the inducement space where there seems to be improprieties. Uh, we need to deal with the tampering in the, in the portal part of it. Uh, I do believe that we need to get to a point where we bring it more in-house uh, with athletic departments to uh, have more hands-on, uh, give more responsibility to the athletic departments to control uh, the NIL activity. Uh, so uh, it's going to continue to evolve. We had a lot of lessons learned over this last year. Uh, hopefully we can continue to make it better. But mainly the, the things I can, I'm concerned about is the inducement space with recruits and, and the tampering. Gene, fascinating times. Thanks that for is. all you do. Spring, Dave. <laughs> and uh, really, really appreciate you taking a few minutes out to speak with us. Well, thank you. I appreciate everything you do. Best of luck. Lincoln Riley getting set for his first year at USC after having tremendous success at Oklahoma. Had this to say about the move to the Big Ten. You can see praise the school's leadership, saying they've been, quote, completely aligned with the vision of what our athletic department can be while always putting our student athletes first. He added, quote, this move to the Big Ten Conference positions all of our teams for long-term success. It provides our student athletes with more exposure, new resources, and challenges them with elite competition. USC football is excited to compete in the Big Ten. Joined now by Fox Sports analyst, former Notre Dame quarterback Brady Quinn, finished in the top four in the Heisman voting a couple times in his fine career in South Bend. And Brady, I, I want to start with kind of what I'm asking everyone. I mean, you cover this sport very closely. You cover both of these leagues, the Pac-12 with USC and UCLA and the Big Ten. What was your reaction when you first heard this news? Well, my first reaction was a little bit surprised, right? Geographically, I think a lot of people are saying, hold on a second now. I've been to Santa Monica Pier. Is, is that Big Ten country now? Is that what we're claiming it is now indeed. here in the Big Ten? Uh, and just being a Midwest kid, a guy from Columbus, Ohio, uh, I, I was excited for it because I, I think what it really does is it allows that Big Ten conference to now you know, stretch across the entire landscape of our country. And instead of you know making college football a regional sport, we're now making a national sport. And I know TV has, has really paved the way in, in doing that, but – that's what you're getting. I mean, you're, you're getting a West Coast, uh, you know, conference or really two teams that really have carried that conference of both football and basketball for quite some time who are now adding to, I think, a, a primetime window um, on, on the West Coast or even being a part of some of those East Coast big time matchups earlier in the day that they just weren't a part of. And so you get that now. And, and I'm excited. I'm, I'm excited to see what it means 
uh, for the Big Ten Conference. I'm excited to see how USC and UCLA stack up. You know, traditionally, I, I, you know, I work with a couple of guys in Matt Line and Reggie Bush. They've been talking a lot of trash, saying, hey, man, look at USC's record versus the Big Ten schools dating back through the years. I said, I, I think times are a little different now, guys. You might want to calm down before we see some of these games played here in a couple of years. Also, fair to mention, those games don't necessarily take place in uh, Big Ten weather. So we shall see. Uh, how they react. I think that's part of it that's, that's going to be really fascinating. But uh, as you mentioned, you know, you do, you're on the, the Fox set with, with a couple of USC guys. Uh, you certainly spend a lot of time out in California during the football season. Give people who maybe don't follow these programs all that closely a sense of what USC and UCLA bring to the Big Ten. I think the biggest thing is just overall talent, especially at the skill position. I mean, you're accustomed to seeing that in the Big Ten, in particular at Ohio State, and Michigan. Um, you know, obviously, you've had your runs for Penn State being a part of that, too, and some other teams have popped up. But, you know, for USC and UCLA, they've traditionally had tremendous skill players, wide receiver, DB, quarterback. And so that's really what they're bringing is that contrast and style of play to the Big Ten. And we'll see how they match up. I mean, the reality is, Ohio State's at, you know, the, the pinnacle of uh, really college sports, or you'd say, or at least in college football, right up there amongst the likes of the Alabamas, the Georgias, and everyone else went thrown into the conversation. Uh, I think USC feels like they can get back to that now with Lincoln Riley as their head coach and the job that he's done recruiting. The biggest thing that I see missing, and I, I think, you know, really they've, they've missed out on since I was going up against Matt Leiner and Reggie Bush back in the heydays, is the guys up front. You know, they don't have the same defensive front. They don't have the same offensive line they used to have. And that's the difference in college football. You know, we all want to talk about these, these five-star, four-star rated quarterbacks and wide receivers and DBs and, and talk about that portion of the game. The game is still won in the trenches. I mean, just go back and look at this past year's national championship and the way Georgia dominated the line of scrimmage on both sides of the football. That's what USC and UCLA are going to have to be able to adapt to in Big Ten country when you've got to go up against teams that love to play a physical brand of football, whether that's Michigan State, Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota, whoever you want to throw in that conversation outside of the teams that I already mentioned in Michigan, who obviously won last year, and Ohio State and Penn State. Brady, you mentioned you grew up in, in Big Ten country outside of Columbus in Dublin, Ohio. You did go to Notre Dame, though, and, and Notre Dame, it seems like now, becomes front and center in this discussion. And, and so I want to ask you, I just asked Gene Smith, he's a Notre Dame grad as well, Interested in your take. How important do you think football independence still is for Notre Dame? Look, football independence for Notre Dame has been a, a huge part of, I think, the tradition and, and really with how the university has been able to capitalize on, on, on keeping in touch with the alumni bases all across the country. One of the advantages Notre Dame has had in being independent is scheduling, you know, a schedule that allows them to play one year all the way on the East Coast and then obviously, you know, play a game at Soldier Stadium and then be out in LA or being in Northern California and really touching all parts of the country as you look to try to drive alumni contributions. Uh, so that's always been a big key of it and remaining independent has helped that. I think we're getting to a point in time though where the Big Ten's offering that. You know, with the addition of USC and UCLA and you know, I, I assume the Big Ten's done for now. I don't know if that's gonna change in the future. Who knows at this point in the, in the world of college football. But I think it offers that now, especially with the addition of, of USC and UCLA to still, you know, play that schedule and still play those opponents uh, that are all across the country. And on top of that, you're looking at revenue that's now generated that's going to be hard to beat no matter what other Power Five conference you're a part of or even as an independent trying to find another major network to pay you for those home games, the rights to those home games. So I think they find themselves in a position where, you know, they don't need to make a decision right now. They can wait and see how things shake out with the Big Ten rights deal that's obviously coming up. And I think you're going to see a number of parties who get left out, who aren't going to be a part of that, th those rights and may not even have college football. And if that's the case, you'd have to think that they'd, they'd be willing to bid a lot of money for Notre Dame's home games when that comes up here in, in two or three years. Uh, so I don't think there's a rush to make a decision right now. I think they'll probably sit back and survey the landscape before they want to make a decision, unless they're, they're hands forced. And we see a change in the college football playoff where they can't be a part of it because they have to be a part of a conference, um, or they feel like there's not going to be that opportunity down the road for them to join the Big Ten or whatever other network because one of those conferences is forcing their hand. Yeah, that's a part of it that I think is really interesting, kind of what will their access to the playoff be, and the models that were floated out a year ago at this time gave them great access to the playoff. Will that continue to be the case? But it is fascinating because, as you say, I mean, part of the appeal is we want to play USC and Stanford every year, and we want to play on the East Coast. Well, you can play USC every year in a conference game, 
And you can play on the East Coast against a number of, of different teams. Maybe you play Stanford in the non-conference, and that's the end of it. But but it's going to be – it'll be fascinating. I'm I'm really interested to see what they decide. Hey, uh, getting off this topic really quickly, Big Ten Media Day is coming up later this month. Just interested in the biggest storylines you're looking forward to in the conference. For me, I think it's really it comes down to the top two teams in the conference. That's always it seems like Ohio State and Michigan. You know, can Michigan really take the momentum from what they built this past season under Jim Harbaugh? They lose so much on defense, in particular a guy like Aiden Hutchinson, uh, and then seeing if they can still you know use that as the foundation for moving forward. How they'll be able to compete with Ohio State. Uh, but my bet is on the Buckeyes. I think when you look at the fact they got CJ Stroud coming back, Josh, Jackson Smith and Jigba, and the way they've you know, uh, continued to develop the wide receiver position, recruit the wide receiver position with Brian Hartline, you'd be hard pressed to find a more talented group. And just something tells me this team is, is going to be itching to get back in a shot to get into the college football playoff and prove themselves. And so it wouldn't be surprising at all if, if at the end of the, you know, end of the year, end of the day, we see the Buckeyes playing off versus Alabama. When you look at the similarities between those two teams, what didn't happen for them last season, but what they have returning and coming back and as talented as they both are, they've got the best two quarterbacks in the country. And that really dominates college football. So they should be squaring off for a national championship when it's all said and done. Who stands out to you on the other side in the West? Uh, it, it's tough to tell at this point. I mean, you'd be hard pressed not to look at Wisconsin, what they did last year with Braylon Allen running the football and think that that shouldn't give them a leg ahead. Uh, if they can get something out of Graham Mertz and they can continue to develop there too, uh, it'd be a huge get, but it, it's, it's trust me. We went to Camp Randall a number of times. That's a tough place to go try to win a football game. Um, there are some uncharacteristic losses, I would say, based on, you know, what we witnessed there in person last year. Um, and so I, I think they'll be able to bounce back and they'll be that dominant physical team that you see that gives people all sorts of headaches. Well, I mean, look, I, I was still going to be on the mix. I'm curious to see what Northwestern is going to bring to the table. Um, you know, obviously they haven't been, I think where they'd like to be at least, uh, last year, you know, at the standard, I think they've held there and keep an eye out for Purdue. And um, that's a talented team that they've, they've had some issues, but I'm a big Aiden O'Connell fan. I, I do think he'll be able to keep them in the mix. He's one of the you know better quarterbacks in college football that we're probably not talking enough about. A uh, great story. A uh, walk on completing 70% of his passes and turning into one of the most prolific passers in the country. Really, uh, really amazing the job that Jeff Brom did last year. And we shall see. And Brady Quinn will be there calling the games. Really appreciate your time, Brady. Thanks so much for the insights. Thanks for having me. Back on Big Ten today, our big stat gives you a little more background on UCLA and USC. UCLA is in Westwood, which is the name in Plaza, is west of downtown LA. Just over 100 years old, has an undergrad enrollment of a bit less than 32,000. 20th ranked school in the nation academically in US News and World Report. Only Northwestern is higher in the current Big Ten. And USC is not far behind. Number 27, older school. It is a private school, about 21,000 undergrads, just a few miles from downtown LA. Trojans have won a staggering 326 Olympic medals and 420 individual NCAA national championships. That is second behind only Stanford. Joined now by Fox Sports analyst, former USC running back Petros Papadakis. He did not win an Olympic medal, although there's still time, Petros. I mean, that <laughs> you, you can still pull I, that off. I, I remember, Dave, going to the parties at the swimmers' houses at, at USC, and these guys, they would come out shirtless with their medals on, walking around. <laughs> uh, it, it's, a, it's a really great athletic environment, and to be an athlete at USC or UCLA is obviously a very special thing. So we saw those guys track and field. Uh, you know, there was a, a lot of very great performers. And you are a third generation Trojan. So you know this school really well. What was your reaction when you first heard this news, Petros? I was surprised, you know, really surprised. I was in a yoga class. <laughs> and, uh, my phone started <laughs> bouncing around and it wouldn't stop and it distracted everybody. Uh, I, was, uh, I was shocked just like everybody else was, but I think after we've gone through a lot of the reasoning and you look at the numbers and the money that's to be made and the money that's been lost, basically from the last Pac-12 television deal, it seems like USC and UCLA had to take their own relevance into their hands and act aggressively and onward and upward. Geography and tradition and all those things be damned. It's going to be a lot of fun to watch. You were disrupting some, uh, some namaste there, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> it was, yes. It was, yes. It, was uh, it was very, uh, <laughs> very uh, wild day, you know, with it's all crazy, the interviews right? and yeah. all the shock and all the indignance. And I mean, in a place like Eugene or Seattle or Salt Lake City, it was a lot different than a place like Los Angeles because obviously USC and UCLA have a destination and the rest of the conference seems to be uh, in real peril. Let's take the UCLA and USC part first. I, I do obviously want to talk about the rest of the conference too, because as you mentioned, there's a, a huge domino effect here. But you talk about the indignance, I'm assuming that came from outside, right? I mean, what, what's been the general feeling at USC and UCLA among the, the people that you know, former teammates, whatnot about this move? I think most teammates are surprised. They are wondering about the geography, about the trips, about building a football team that has to play in West Lafayette or Champaign-Urbana or Happy Valley in November. I mean, our biggest concern in the Pac-10 and now Pac-12, or was, Pac-12 conference uh, was always, are we going to get caught in November up in Pullman, Washington, uh, in Washington State? And that that was the worst that could happen, and everywhere else was, was pretty safe. And that's not going to be the case anymore weather-wise. And USC is going to have to do what they needed to do for quite some time anyway, which is redouble their efforts to fix their defensive and offensive fronts to play in a league where if you don't do that, you'll get run over. Give us a sense for what's going on at USC football-wise. I mean, there's been so much excitement nationally around Lincoln Riley. It was a bold hire, to say the least. I mean, the notion that you could go in to a powerhouse program like Oklahoma and take their coach literally from under their noses. It, it really sent shockwaves through the country. We've seen Lincoln Riley's recruiting. He's been great in the portal. Give us a sense of kind of the program he's trying to build at USC. It's interesting. It looks a lot like uh, his Oklahoma program, just as far as assistance goes. And he's going to have to learn to swim in the Pacific Ocean, so to speak, <laughs> and navigate this conference, and then another one. and they need to develop players and that's not been happening at usc in quite some time ucla has developed much better players and put more players in the nfl draft under chip kelly than usc has even though the usc recruiting is always through the roof regardless of who the head coach is and uh, i think that lincoln riley is an offensive genius really in the way that we used to talk about lane kiffin and steve sarkeesian Actually, Lincoln Riley, that's true about him. I've watched him at ECU and did the games in Conference USA and then a lot of his stuff at Oklahoma. And I think he brings a great offensive spark to USC. But they need to recruit offensive and defensive line and develop them. USC's had great receivers. They've done fine uh, with offensive skill people. That hasn't been a success for them. They need to go back to what was successful in the Pete Carroll era, the John McKay era, the Howard Jones era of USC. And I think this move to the Big Ten is, is going to make that even more of an urgent uh, issue for them to deal with. What about UCLA? I mean, there had been a lot of disappointment around Chip Kelly. And then last year, it really felt like, at least from afar, as kind of a casual observer of the program, it felt like they had turned a corner to me. I mean, you could really see them clicking offensively. Is there a feeling now that UCLA is ready to get kind of to the point people anticipated they'd be at when they hired Kelly? It's interesting, Dave, because UCLA really got stripped down to the bolts by Chip Kelly when he took over. I mean, he did exactly what he wanted on his own timeline, and they improved very slowly every year under Chip Kelly. And we've talked about the player development, the draft picks, the tight ends, different guys like that that he's developed and pulled out of nowhere, you know, places that uh, guys from places that were not heavily recruited, just kind of his flavor and style, sort of like he did at Oregon. I do think UCLA right now is in a better position to run the ball and stop the run at, in the Big Ten. Uh, I think that they're a formidable football program. I mean, the last time UCLA played USC, they scored 63 points on them. So, uh, and that's not the very, uh, that's that's a very recent past. <laughs> it's been not that long ago. So uh, UCLA's got, got some good things going for it under Chip Kelly. Uh, how will that look 
in all of these different places around uh, the Big Ten Conference is going to be fascinating to see. I, I, I'm just not sure. I don't want to let you go without touching on what you were mentioning at the beginning, and that is kind of the future of the Pac-12. And there are reports today of the Big 12 now trying perhaps to move in and, and swoop up the majority of the remaining Pac-12 teams. Uh, what is going on? Like, kind of what are you hearing, and, and what's your sense of the future of the Pac-12? Yeah, the thing I worry about the most is for Cal and Stanford. I, I worry that they're going to kind of fade into the back ground and use the academic part of their school as kind of an excuse to get out of big time college football. And that would be sad for me because I mean, we've had some great Stanford teams very recently. And you think about Aaron Rodgers and Marshawn Lynch and Jeff Tedford at Cal. Uh, that's very sad. Uh, in the immediate, you know, I wonder what kind of reception USC and UCLA is going to get on the road this year in places like Utah, uh, places like Arizona State. I mean, basically, this blew up the entire conference. Now, we all know it was about a decade-old TV deal that blew up the conference, but there's going to be some really raw and angry feelings in the immediate, uh, depending on where everybody else ends up. But uh, the two schools I'm worried most about are the four, I guess, which are places I really like. Uh, Corvallis, Oregon, Oregon State, very good coach, Jonathan Smith, uh, young program that's really improving. Washington State, uh, what's going to happen there? I mean, Drew Bledsoe, Ryan Leaf, a great history there. Uh, I, I just don't know. Cal Stanford, I don't know. It looks like the Big 12 is going to scoop up those other uh, six, maybe. And Oregon and Washington, uh, they are like uh, some pretty good programs, kind of a, a little jewels up there. And uh, I think somebody will be happy to have them in their conference. But it's a wild time, to say the least. whole thing is utterly fascinating, Petros. <laughs> I mean, the thought that a week ago we would have been talking about this on the 5th of July would have seemed so implausible. And yet, here we are. Fascinating times. Petros Papadakis, really appreciate your insights and your time. Thanks a lot. Anytime. Hey, I love the Big Ten. I've always been around the Big Ten. The Big Ten blew up my conference. <laughs> there you go. Well, you're you're a part of the Big Ten now, Petros, and we're glad to have you. <laughs> Take care, my friend. Have a great day. Thanks, guys. As you are surely aware, it is men's hoops, which carries the mantle for the UCLA Athletic Department in many ways, a record 11 national titles. They were back in the Final Four two years ago under Mick Cronin. He had this to say of the move to the Big Ten, quote, Obviously, leaving the Pac-12 is bittersweet for UCLA, especially for our older Bruins. That said, the landscape of college athletics is changing dramatically, and our move to the Big Ten is in the best long-term interest of our university as we move forward. Big Ten basketball has been leading the country and putting the most teams in the NCAA tournament, and that is a plus. The exciting new rivalries and opponents coming to Pauley Pavilion will be awesome for our fans. We also get to preserve our great games with USC. In terms of recruiting, UCLA is a worldwide brand, and joining the Big Ten, which is now a coast-to-coast -coast powerhouse, can make us more attractive to recruits in the Midwest and along the East Coast. Andy Katz joins us now, and Andy, lots of talk about football, but this is a significant move for men's basketball, and I think you do need to start with UCLA. Again, this is the program that's won more national titles than any other, as everyone who follows the sport knows, but yeah, it's been about 30 years since they won one. Where is this UCLA program now under Mick Cronin? Give us a sense of, of kind of where they are and his attempts to, to get it back to being perennial power year in and year out. So look, I know we're going to talk about USC momentarily as well, but I will just say I think the timing is perfect to add UCLA and USC because they finally, both programs, have stability. Uh, Mick Cronin came to UCLA as a destination job uh, after being incredibly successful at Cincinnati. Uh, before that, at Murray State, uh, he just got a long-term contract, got the Bruins to the Final Four during the bubble year, and consistently has UCLA since he's been there, uh, which is not that long, uh, near or competing for the top of the Pac-12. Uh, they are a national brand, as we know, and there's no question that when you make an ad in either football or men's basketball, obviously the two financially rich sports, you have to make sure that you add value 
for your television partners, for all your branding and your marketing. And there is no bigger brand, I think, in college sports than those four letters. Because of the John Wooden era of 10 straight national championships, um, you know, UCLA, everyone knows UCLA. And by the way, uh, for those of us that have college-aged high school students that are trying to go to college, UCLA is the most applied to school in the country. That's how popular it is. Uh, over 100,000 applications. So you are adding a brand that is incredibly popular, has a great alumni base. Uh, if there's any kind of criticism constructively, has not been a great travel uh, alumni base if they're in LA uh, to other parts of the Pac-12, uh, but that's a minor little you know, thing that we can maybe pick on. But for the most part, I think this is a huge win uh, for a variety of reasons, not just historically, but in the present tense. And here in two seasons, I fully expect them to be in the thick of the upper tier of the Big Ten on a regular basis. What about USC? Uh, Andy Enfield had them within one game of the Final Four a couple years ago. It would have been their first Final Four in about 70 years. So this is a program that certainly has had some moments, has had some real star players through the years, but it seems like he's kind of putting it together in, in ways that we haven't seen in a while. Give, give us a sense of where the Trojans are right now, hoops wise. Well, this is all you got to know that Andy Enfield was um, a serious candidate. I would argue maybe the number one candidate at Maryland before Maryland went with Kevin Willard. Uh, and he ended up re signing with USC. So ultimately, he gets to the Big Ten, uh, assuming everyone stays where they should over the next two seasons. Uh, and so he wanted to stay at USC because he has put down roots uh, and they've done a great job recruiting. Uh, obviously, the Mobley brothers, now both in the NBA, uh, have added uh, you know, to a number of NBA players that have come through uh, the Galen Center and USC. Uh, they continue to recruit nationally. They do well in the transfer market. And they are the little brother to the big brother UCLA in basketball. It's reversed, obviously, in football. But they are consistently good uh, to where they are not in the lower tier. And, and I, that's the thing is, you're adding two programs that I think are going to be in competition for the upper tier of the Big Ten and NCAA tournament bursts to where in the Big Ten, every year, really the last three years, you know, we've been talking around 9 to 10 some of you guys on the set think I'm crazy when I've said 11, but really that 9 to 10 range of bids. And I think with 16 members, we are going to be talking on a consistent basis of double-figure NCAA tournament berths going forward from 24, from 2024 on, that that is going to be the norm for the Big Ten. Uh, I would say even more than a 16-team SEC, I feel, and I'm not just saying this, but uh, because of the additions, and where everyone else is within the Big Ten, I think we are consistently going to have three-fourths of the Big Ten in the NCAA tournament. There's some pragmatic questions you have to deal with anytime you expand your league in terms of scheduling, the tournament. What do you see as kind of the, the proper models here going forward? Well, I think it's going to be critical uh, because you can do it in men's basketball and women's basketball, but where you play everyone at least once. And so I would like to see... And I know they haven't done this yet because it just happened, but a 20 game schedule, keep that 20 games where you play one team, uh, excuse me, 10 teams once and five teams twice to get to those 20 games. You can rotate those five, or maybe you have one partner that you're always going to play. Obviously, you would want USC and UCLA to play twice, Michigan, Michigan State, we know Indiana, Purdue, et cetera. Um, so I think 20 games. 10 games against one team, five, uh, five teams you play twice. As for the conference tournament, Dave, all you're really doing is adding two more games on Wednesday. So you could have four games Wednesday, four games Thursday, four games Friday, two Saturday, one Sunday. Uh, so it's not a major shift in terms of the conference tournament in terms of days of the week. Keep that Wednesday to Sunday schedule. And I also fully anticipate... At some point in that rotation, uh, you know, five to seven years out, I think we'll be in L.A. 
uh, to where the conference tournament will be in LA to, to rotate around. Uh, and, and, you know, I, with, with proper notice, I think the fan bases would love to make that trip uh, during the course of a conference tournament week. And then the last thing I'll say on this is that what this ensures where you're bringing in USC and UCLA, whether you play them twice or four times during the course of the regular season, you are guaranteeing quality games. And every team is judged individually for the NCAA tournament. And so you're adding at least a minimum of two more quality games, maybe four, depending on if you play them twice, that's only going to enhance your postseason resume. Agree 100%. Hey, before we let you go, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't look ahead just a bit to next season. Big Ten lost a ton of talent. I mean, you had three top 10 picks. You had nine NBA draft picks overall. So uh, certainly there was a lot that was lost from the league, but a lot of quality players coming back. Give me a preseason favorite. I think it's Indiana. Uh, we've been waiting for this day for quite some time, but I think going back to maybe 2013 with Zeller and Oladipo, that this is the most talented Indiana team we've seen with Trace Jackson Davis coming back as the potential preseason Big Ten player of the year. I, I think the Hoosiers, and they've got a great schedule for next season, I think we will enter next season with Indiana as the preseason favorite in the Big Ten. Really good recruiting class as well to add to it. Yeah, Mike Woodson has put a good group together. It'll be fascinating to see. I mean, Illinois, a totally overhauled roster, but, but a lot of talent there. Michigan, Ohio State, where those guys fit in. Got a dark horse for us? I'm driving that bus, Dave. <laughs> Not giving up on Rutgers. Still. Cliff Amore, Paul Mulcahy, and the Big Ten reigning defensive player yeah. of the year. Caleb McConnell is back. Steve Peichel told me in this offseason, loves his team. I know they all love their team, but he really does love this group. I really believe that Rutgers is going to be an NCAA tournament team again. Dark horse. Yeah, no, I, I, they got a really good uh, portal pickup as well at Cam Spencer, so uh, no doubt. I mean, they're going to they're gonna be in the discussion. I, I laugh only because uh, no one drives the Rutgers bus <laughs> with more passion than one Andy Katz. Uh, great to see you, my friend. Uh, continue to enjoy your summer, and uh, we'll be talking hoops in this studio soon enough. Can't wait. All right, thanks, Dave. Our buddy Dave Wanstead coached D-line at USC for a couple years in the 1980s, and he joins us now. And, Coach, we had Petros on earlier, USC guy. He wanted me to <laughs> say hello to you, so we pass along Petros' greetings. Well, well I, you, Reverend, you know, we do a lot of shows together, and I cannot do a show without telling at least one story. <laughs> Petros, yeah, we have done some games together uh, when I was doing some college stuff with Fox in L.A., but when I was coaching at USC, Petros's father – had the best Greek restaurant in L.A. And, you know, when you bring these recruits in for a weekend visit, part of it is you take them to a couple of restaurants and you want to introduce them to, to L.A. You want to say, this is what USC is about. And the spot we took them to was Petros's father's restaurant. So a lot of tradition there uh, from the Trojan family, absolutely. That is outstanding. Give us a sense for your time at USC. I mean, look, it was a long time ago. But you guys made it to a Rose Bowl. You took on it and beat Ohio State while you were there. Uh, this is a powerhouse program. It certainly was then. It, it still is now. Well, what should we expect from USC football? Well, you know, during the intro, you said I, I coached the defensive line at USC, and I was the defensive coordinator at Oklahoma State. And this might be unheard of with some of these young coaches. Everybody wants to be the head coach in the next two years. But I left being a defensive coordinator. At that time, it was a Big 8. Now it's a Big 12, Oklahoma State. And that conference...